Hi, I'm Daniel Chan from UNSW Sydney. Welcome to another adventure in pure mathematics. One of the main problems in number theory is the solution of Diophantine equations. And in this short video today, I want to give you a simple example of Diophantine equations to motivate some of the important themes in number theory and show you a brief introduction to the topic. So the question I want to pose is fairly simple here. I want to look at the following equation, x squared plus y squared equals 7z squared. And I just want to ask, are there non-trivial rational solutions to this equation here? Okay, so let me just uh, emphasize, rational just means uh, rational numbers inside Q. So we're looking for solutions there as opposed to over the reals or the complexes where you use different methods. And what do I mean by non-trivial here? Well, certainly there's a solution if you set x, y, and z all equal to zero. For a non-trivial one, I want to find one where not all of them are zero. And the answer to this is quite simple enough. The answer turns out to be no. And what I want to do in this video is to show you why that's the case. And that's fairly uh, easy. So this is a typical Diophantine equation where you're looking for solutions, not over reals or complexes, but in the rationals. Okay, so since x, y, and z are rational numbers, if we want to try to solve this, we can write them as fractions. So uh, x as a on d, y as b on d, and z as c on d. And we can assume that the, there is a common denominator in all three of these fractions. And then to solve this is the same as well multiplying throughout by this d squared, and then you'll get the following equation, a squared plus b squared equals 7c squared. And here you'll note that this equation is in fact exactly the same as the original one. The only difference now is that we're looking for integer solutions as opposed to rational solutions. Okay, So this is in, in itself is also an important problem in number theory where you look instead of at rational solutions, you're asking for integer solutions. Okay, and we got that just by clearing denominators here, so we changed the equation a little bit. So something else that you can do is that, well, suppose that A, B, and C have a common factor. Well, in that case, you can get uh, that common factor will occur as a square in this equation, and we can divide out by the square of that common factor. And then what will happen is that if we assume there's a non-trivial solution, then we'll get another solution which has smaller magnitude. Okay, so we can assume that there are no common factors uh, to A, B, and C. Okay, so that's the reduction that we have. We're solving this equation here for integers, and we can assume that they these A, B, and C, these integers, have no common factors. Okay, so suppose this holds. Well, one of the things that we can do is we can look at this equation modulo 7. Okay? And in which case this equation still holds but as a congruence equation. So if this holds, we know that there's a solution modulo 7. So to show our answer here is no, we just have to show that there are no solutions modulo 7. Okay, so modulo 7 means that we work now in the ring Z wants 7, which is just the field with the 7 elements. And what happens to this equation modulo 7? Well, of course, this right-hand term becomes 0, and you're just left with these two terms over here. And that's part of the reason why we chose 7, is to make this term 0. So the equation we're looking at is a congruence equation, a squared plus b squared, is congruent to 0 modulo 7. Okay, now this equation here is a lot easier to solve. We can say precisely what all the solutions are. And the reason why is that, well, what can A and B be? Their residue class is modulo 7, so there are only seven possibilities for what they can be. So you can run through the seven possibilities for A and the seven possibilities for B and find out what happens. And if you think a little bit harder, you can streamline that uh, solution. Okay, and we'll do it as follows. Okay, we'll pick some A, which we'll think of modulo 7, so it's a residue class from 0 up to 6, and we'll compute all the possible squares for what it can be. 
So 0 squared, of course, is just 0. 1 squared is 1. 2 squared is 4. 3 squared is 9. And 9 modulo 7 is 2. And we can keep going to work out the others. Of course, uh, if you have your wits about you, you can also realize that, well, 6 is just minus 1. So when you square that, it's the same as 1 squared, so you get 1 here. 5 is minus 2 modulo 7, so it's the same as 2 squared, 4 here. And 4 squared is the same as the 3 squared, so you get 2 there. So there are all the possibilities for the square, modulo 7. So a squared can be one of these numbers here, one of these residue classes. And the same with b squared. And we want to say, when does the sum equal 0? One, seven. Of course, one possibility is that both a squared and b squared are zero, which occur when a and b are zero. So that's one possibility, but are there any others? Well, let's have a little think about if there can be others. Well, what's the biggest value that you can have here? Well, I guess you can have a four uh, plus this four or that four. So that's eight, which is not congruent to zero modulo seven. And what's the next biggest after that? I guess you can add a 4 and a 2, which is too small. So if you're going to be congruent to 0 modulo 7, but the sum of those two numbers is less than 7, I guess you can only have 0. So the only possibility for the squares are they're both 0, and they can only come when both A and B are congruent to 0 modulo 7. OK, so when we try to solve this modulo 7, we do get solutions. But we can say something about those solutions, and that's going to be the key to tell us how to solve this Diophantine equation. So a and b are congruent to 0 modulo 7, so they're multiples of 7, and we can divide them by 7. So we can let a bar equal a divided by 7, this integer here, and b bar equal b divided by 7. And then we can put these new variables back into this equation and rewrite this equation. Okay. So remember, a now is a multiple of 7. It's 7 times a bar. So we can take this equation, uh, rewrite it in terms of a bar and b bar, and divide it by 7. So a was 7a bar. So when you square that, you get 49a bar squared. Divided by 7, you get 7a bar squared. And similarly, for the next term, the b squared over here, that becomes 7b bar squared. And you divide it, remember, this equation by 7. So the last term is c squared. So there's your c squared. Now when you look at this, of course, you'll see that the left-hand side is divisible by 7. So the right-hand side has to be divisible by 7 too. And by prime factorization, the only way that that can happen is if 7 divides c. So that means that 7 divides a, b, and c. And that gives us the contradiction that we asked for. So that shows that indeed, if you ask for rational solutions to this, there are no non-trivial solutions. So the only solution is where x, y, and z are all zero. So we should make some important remarks about this rather interesting example here. So what are they? So firstly, as I mentioned, one of the main problems in number theory is solving Diophantine equations, which essentially means you're interested in solving polynomial equations, but you're looking for solutions over some non-closed field, such as the rational numbers. If you want to look at solutions over, for example, the complex numbers, then really you're in the realm of algebraic geometry, and you should be using more geometric techniques to try to answer that question. So that's the first thing. The second thing was, well, how do we actually go about showing that there were no solutions? Okay, so the key here was to modify the equation so that we weren't looking for solutions inside our, over the rationals, okay? But rather, we were looking for integer solutions. So in more general sort of parlance, that means that we want to look at an integral model R for our field. So in general, you want to solve over some field F. And here, we want to look at some integral model, uh, in this case, the integers. And by integral model, we mean that the field of fractions of this Z is um, this field here, in this case, the rational numbers. So these uh, things are strongly related to each other. 
And why was it that we passed to this integral model Z? What was the advantage of working there? And this is the key point. Well, when you work with the integers, this is a ring as opposed to a field, so it has lots of ideals, and in particular we can talk about prime ideals in some meaningful way. There are lots of them, and you can use a lot of the theory of prime ideals, in particular prime factorization. So there are a lot of techniques that can use here because there's a rich ring theory associated to this ring R. If you look at just a field, the only ideals you have are the whole field itself and the zero, and you don't have as many tools to play around with. And that's not the case here. So these are going to be very important themes in number theory, looking at integral models and studying things like prime factorization in that integral model. I hope you enjoyed this adventure in pure mathematics.